Welcome to Upstate. Uh, my name is Stephen Knoll. I am the Residency Program Director and the Vice Chair for Education. Thanks for taking the time to visit us. And uh, the PowerPoint that you see here is an overview of the program. So feel free to move wherever you'd like throughout the, the video. Uh, hopefully this gives you a very good idea of what Upstate can provide for you for your internal medicine residency experience. This is our agenda. So this is what we'll be covering in this video. We'll start first with the Educational Programs Office. Obviously, those people that are entrusted with designing the curriculum and your overall residency experience. Obviously, the chair of the department, myself as the program director and the vice chair for education. We have our associate program directors. We have our program administrating staff. And then we have our chief residents. Our mission for you is, uh, number one, we want to train you to be outstanding clinicians and scholars. We think we've done really well on that front. If you look at our board pass rate, we're amongst the best in the country uh, for our success uh, on the boards. And if you're looking at, well, where do, you, where do you go when you're done with your training when uh, leaving our program? If you have a desire to move into fellowship, you can see uh, by reviewing on our website, we place people into highly competitive programs in all specialties. If you're looking to enter into primary care or hospitalist medicine, we do extremely well on that front as well. And again, that information is provided on our website. We believe that our success rests in how we've designed the program. So it's creating an environment, a culture that is uh, you know, challenging yet supportive. Uh, we are fully compliant with the ACGME as well as with New York State's additional duty hour requirements. And again, speaking to culture, we have a mentoring program in which you'll be paired with a faculty member that you'll meet with throughout your training. Uh, and we also have uh, a big brother, big sister program. So you're paired with a senior resident. And uh, along with that, we have our social and wellness committee to create events uh, throughout the year that uh, again, support uh, wellness and resilience. If we look at our three primary hospital sites, University Hospital in the middle is our primary site. Uh, we provide all services at University Hospital. It's a level one trauma center. It is the only academic hospital uh, serving about 1.8 million people in 17 counties. That's the yellow that you see there uh, with the red dot being us. And um, University Hospital continues to uh, undergo expansion. Uh, we are uh, building a new ambulatory center, which you'll see on the next slide. So that'll be a state-of-the-art center for your continuity care and other outpatient uh, uh, medicine experiences. Our neighbor, the VA hospital, is uh, serving obviously a very different patient population, our veterans, and then uh, our uh, neighboring hospital, Krauss Hospital, is a private institution. And uh, as a private hospital uh, in the city, it's serving a different patient population. So you have a state uh, hospital uh, serving an entire region. You have a veterans hospital serving our veterans. And you have a private hospital that's serving more of the local community. This is the uh, campus. You can see that the medical school, Weisscotton and Setnor Halls, are surrounded by the three hospitals I just uh, pointed out on the prior slide. Uh, our continuity clinics are currently housed at UHCC there on the bottom right. But as you can see, uh, that's going to be moving uh, to what is a currently being constructed new ambulatory center called the Nappy Longevity Institute, uh, slated to be completed in 2023, and we will move our continuity care and other outpatient experiences uh, to this new ambulatory uh, building, which uh, will be nice, especially in the winter time, because it will all be physically connected by um, walkways and bridges to the parking structures, as well as to the oncology uh, center and uh, university hospital. Uh, I do mention the parking garage because oftentimes uh, you guys will ask, where do I park in relation to where I train? And you can see that we really, one of the advantages of our program in our opinion is that we have everything that you need 
right at where you park. So you park right on the campus and then you've got the access to the ambulatory centers, the primary hospital sites, um, the medical school and the campus activities building. If you look at the city of Syracuse, uh, I'm showing you where Upstate Medical University is in relation to, for example, Syracuse University, which is uh, neighboring us. That's where the Carrier Dome is. Uh, the Carrier Dome is uh, no longer looking like this. It's been uh, redone, but um, this is where if you're going to see traffic in our area, this will be uh, when there's an event at the Carrier Dome. Otherwise, very easy to get around in Syracuse. Uh, Marshall Street is, think of that as sort of the college town kind of life, and it's shared by Upstate and Syracuse University. A little more cultured, more nightlife is Armory Square, also living opportunities in that area. And then you can see Onondaga Lake uh, in the background with uh, the mega mall, Destiny USA, uh, right along the shores. In terms of living, you can pretty much live wherever you'd like in Syracuse. Cost of living is very reasonable. Many choose to live uh, in um, buildings that are literally right adjacent to Upstate Medical University, which you can see on this picture. But again, you can live wherever you want. And um, honestly, uh, you can live, say, 10, 15 miles away, and it'll only take you about 10, 15 minutes to get in. If we look a little more specifically at the residency program, uh, in terms of how many uh, house staff, we've got 36 categoricals per year. We have 19 prelims, so that gives us 127 total uh, core house staff. We have seven chief residents, and then we have 58 fellows. Uh, salaries are listed for you here as of July of 2022. Uh, if you look at your salary and you want to know, well, is this a competitive salary, I think it's important to understand the value of the dollar in the market in which you are, uh, will be doing your training. So I'm showing you here essentially a cost of living comparison. And um, certainly all of the places I'm showing have some excellent programs. And in fact, your dollar goes a little further in a market like Cleveland compared to Syracuse. If you look at where most people that are applying uh, when they're applying to Syracuse, more are applying to the East Coast. And you can see that uh, your dollar doesn't stretch as far uh, for that same salary. Now, if you're making a salary that is commensurate with the market in which you're training, then it's it's a non-issue. But uh, there aren't, for example, uh, salaries for house staff of $137,000 uh, in New York City. So uh, again, Salary is certainly an important factor, but think about salary relative to the market in which you'll be training. Sperling's is a uh, reputable site that you can do a cost of living comparison, which I put in on the bottom right for you. Um, more benefits that you have uh, in our residency program. So again, the uh, parking right on site. Uh, we do provide financial support for your education and as well as scholarship. We do provide meals for uh, our noon didactics and noon report, as well as on-call money to uh, provide meals for you uh, when you're on call. And then we do uh, purchase and launder your white coats. If we look at the format of our training, here we're a bit different. Um, this picture, this tug of war, is what I describe as the traditional format of when you're doing, say, an inpatient service and you have to do one to two half days of your continuity clinic on the outpatient side. And, you know, that creates some stress in the day because you've got to leave your inpatients to try to manage your outpatients. Do you, how do you remain focused? It adds time to your day because you're leaving unfinished work and you need to come back to complete that work. Um, so in our program, we've cut that uh, rope. We don't have the traditional, we've embraced a block format. We, we were not the first program to embrace a block format, but we were the first to embrace a particular type of block format, which is what we call the three plus one. I think many block programs you see are more in the four plus or six plus. I don't believe in that model because I don't believe that we do well when we're on the same service for four weeks at a time. If you think about what you've done, for example, in clerkships, we generally start to feel like we're draining a bit after maybe two and a half to three weeks of doing the same thing. So in order to keep your energy up, 
uh, I've created a system in which you don't do any particular experience for any more than two weeks at a time. So to give you a little more detail, this is the categorical uh, example on this page. Uh, the following slide will show the preliminary. So what you see is there's a skeleton. So each column here represents one week. So there's 52 of these columns. And then you see that the skeleton repeats itself. So it repeats itself 13 times. 13 times 4 is 52 weeks. During CC, <clears throat> you have five half days of your ambulatory um, continuity clinic. The other five half days, we have created 13 specialty experiences. So for example, maybe uh, during a particular CC block, you'll do five half days of nephrology, five half days of rheumatology. But we've also, in addition to you, what you would think of as general medicine and its specialties, we've created additional experiences, like maybe you'll do five half days of simulation or five half days of community health, uh, five half days of education. So that is the continuity clinic week. When you're not on CC, the rules that we created are if you do an inpatient team or ICU service, it's two weeks. Anything else that you could think of that would be built into the program, an admitting service, night service, um, quality rotations, electives, they're all built as one week with no repeating except for electives. Electives can repeat. So you can see, for example, if you see my arrow, you can see that this individual has an elective. This individual has three electives. This individual has two electives. Now, you can go through a four-week cycle with not having any elective. You can see, for example, this individual. So uh, there's no guarantee of an elective every four-week uh, cycle, but you will have electives throughout the entire year. So that is the three plus one system. If we look at the preliminary year, I'm showing you the 19 prelims on the top. But I'm also showing you that we have a, other categorical programs at our institution that require a year in internal medicine. And so it, uh, because they don't follow a three plus one, I can't create a three plus one for the prelims. But I try to apply the same rules, whereas, you know, you don't do more than a week at a time on an admitting or a night. And we try to not uh, have any back to back to back to back teams. It's unavoidable, unfortunately, and so we try to limit that to no more than two to three teams in a row. The uh, advantage for the prelims is that they can have more back to back to back to back to back elective times. Um, and so uh, the prelim schedule is a little different than the categorical schedule. This just gives you a little more detail. It's a bit more granular. So you can see the categorical and the prelim and the number of weeks that you'd be doing on each of our particular services. You can also see that the uh, categoricals have about 11 weeks of elective time, while the prelims have about 16 weeks of elective time. Uh, the uh, other piece is that for the categoricals, their elective time in their intern year can only be spent within the Department of Medicine as opposed to the prelims. Prelims elective time can be spent in any department. We don't uh, put any restrictions on that. Uh, if you look at the number of weeks roughly then for each of our services, you can see them listed here. The other piece that I would point out is that when you're on continuity clinic, that CC block, we don't have any call requirements. So uh, they are all technically golden weekends so that you have your Saturday and Sunday. However, to create balance for the interns, we have taken some of the golden weekends that the categoricals have and distributed them to the prelims. So categorical interns don't get a golden weekend every four weeks, but they certainly get golden weekends throughout the year. But years two and three, they do get a golden weekend every four weeks when they do their continuity clinic week. Vacation is otherwise uh, four year, uh, excuse me, four weeks. 
and uh, vacation is assigned in blocks for the interns. Uh, the uh, PGY 2s and 3s can choose their vacation time uh, however it best fits their schedule and if it's on a, a required service then they're required to find coverage. If we look at elective opportunities the things that you would think about is you know regular electives we obviously offer uh, but some of the things that may be a little different that you wouldn't normally think of for example we have a metabolic stone clinic we have a transplant clinic there are opportunities to do POCUS electives outside of our POCUS three-year course, which I'll describe a bit later. There's an HIV clinic, there's a refugee clinic. There are opportunities to do uh, a, an experience at the NIH, although because of COVID that's currently on hold, there is a transgender clinic, a pulmonary hypertension clinic, cystic fibrosis clinic, as well as a hepatology clinic. So those are some of the additional elective opportunities um, beyond the normal electives that you would think of in your training. This gives you a sense of the call requirements uh, between the three institutions. What I would point out as it relates to call is if you are an intern and you are assigned to a call, then there is a senior also doing that same call. So we have that redundancy, we have that supervision. In addition, uh, there is an attending that's in-house uh, 24 7 if there are interns who are the primary call people uh, so for example like night float there's a senior but there's also an attending uh, our only 24-hour call requirement is uh, for the pgy threes when they're rotating through the kraus icu otherwise no 24-hour call requirements when you're not on a required service and you're, for example, on an elective, uh, you may have your weekends in addition to those golden weekends we were discussing earlier. But it's also possible that when you're on an elective, you may be assigned Jeopardy. Jeopardy is your poll so that in case somebody is ill or presenting at a meeting or is interviewing for a job, you are able to pull somebody sort of off the bench, uh, quote unquote. And the uh, prelims have more elective time, so they may have a little more jeopardy. We try to balance that out by also then uh, assigning more jeopardy time to our uh, categorical interns so that it, it isn't weighted so heavily uh, for the prelims. If we look at scholarship, again, one of the requirements of this program is uh, you must be scholarly. This is an academic program. Your scholarship can come in many forms. It can be through obviously research, but it could be through writing up a case report or a review article or a book chapter, presenting a poster or doing an oral presentation at a national meeting. Those are all forms of scholarship. What you see there in blue is what we did in the last academic year as it relates to scholarship. And then the green just again shows the uh, financial support we provide for the scholarship itself, that's the $600 per year. But also, uh, if you do uh, publish as a first author in a peer-reviewed PubMed Index journal, you, we will add $300 uh, to your scholarship fund on an annual basis. You can't go through our program without having some formal education on a daily basis. And what you see here is just all of the different venues in which we provide formal didactics on a daily basis. So it doesn't matter whether you're doing inpatient, outpatient, required service, elective, there's always going to be some type of formal education on a daily basis. As it relates to COVID, there, are, there may be times where we have to do things virtually, for example, via Zoom, where we can do it in person, we do it in person. So it's hard for me to tell you today what things will look like in July of 2022, but it's uh, uh, right now we are uh, at a point where we are able to do everything in person. But obviously uh, things remain in flux. Uh, things that we do that may be innovative or uh, perhaps a little different than you'll see at other programs. Uh, when we do our noon report, noon report is generally 30 minutes is spent doing mix app. So we do board review every day. 
There's an attending of the week, and that defines the specialty in which we'll be doing board review. And then the second 30 minutes is where we present a case. The case can be any uh, specialty. It does not need to be re related to the attending for that week. What we do for uh, the first and third Friday of every month, however, is we scratch that format and we invite emergency medicines uh, house staff on service with an attending from emergency to join us. And we say, okay, now we've got two 30 minute blocks. First 30 minutes, we want emergency medicine to present a case that was admitted to medicine last night. And then the second 30 minutes, we want internal medicine to present a case that emergency medicine asked internal medicine to admit last night or within the uh, recent past. And now what that does is it allows for both departments to now learn from one another, to perhaps have some uh, element of quality review as it relates to how a patient was brought through the system. And it's also an opportunity to build relationships because you're sitting with the people that you're working with very closely, having lunch with them, learning from them. And so um, uh, that's EMIM report. POCUS, you know, we talked about the elective opportunities, but there's also a POCUS curriculum that has been uh, spearheaded by Dr. Gambier, one of our associate program directors, our vice chair for quality, and also our POCUS director for the program. He's very passionate about POCUS, has worked very hard uh, to build a curriculum, which we introduced in 2020. Um, it's been very popular. It's a three-year course uh, that all the categoricals will participate in. RRT code, uh, when you think about being on service in many programs, when you're on call, you're also carrying the you know, RRT code pager, which means that let's say you're rounding on your patients in the morning and suddenly the pager goes off, you need to leave your work and you need to go tend to that RRT code. Well, if you think about what that does to your day, it adds stress to your day, length to your day. It also doesn't make your own patients very happy because they're losing you to something else. So to keep focus so that you can manage your patients, we've created a separate RRT code team at University Hospital, where we have a PGY-3 with a PGY-1 working directly with our RRT code nursing team, which we call SWAT. And that team responds to all codes and RRTs in the hospital 24 seven. So you can now imagine that you're gonna get a very robust experience in RRT code and not be impacted by other work for being on teams, for example. 2020, so if you think about residency clinics, uh, residency clinics uh, in terms of show rates around the country, let's say you schedule five patients for a half day of clinic, uh, the average show rate is maybe 60 to 70%, which means that 30 to 40% of your time is wasted and it's unpredictable. And as a program director, wanting to make sure you have a worthwhile experience, um, it doesn't make sense to just all sort of sit there and say, yeah, all right, whatever. So what I proposed was, why don't we take one of our half days in clinic and really extend be beyond the four walls? And I want the house staff to reach out and connect with their patient panel, call them up, uh, video them, whatever it is, you know, tell me about how the insulin pump is working. How did that chiropractor appointment go? Where are things with uh, authorization for that MRI? Whatever it may be, I want you to connect with your patients because I believe if you do that, your patients are going to want to come back to see you so that when they're scheduled for a visit, they'll show. And so uh, if we look at our show rate, we have a show rate at UHCC of close to 90%. So what does this mean for you? Well, instead of scheduling five, say patients per half day, five days, five of those half days, which would be 25 patients with maybe only 15 to 16 patients showing over that week. Now we say, well, there's four half days and we schedule five for each. So that's 20 patients, but now we're having 18 of the patients showing. So you now you get more exposure to your continuity experience. You're getting more exposure to your patients. Your patients are winning because they're getting more exposure to you and hopefully keeping them out of the emergency room. And then obviously volume is good for the hospital, right? Because volume translates into dollars. So this has been a win-win-win and that's 2020. So the name 2020 is cut 
the number of days of clinic by 20% in order to hopefully grow the show rate per clinic day by 20%. Uh, EMS uh, ride-alongs are an opportunity for you to uh, ride along with the ambulance when you're doing your Kraus emergency room rotation. Uh, telemedicine is not something that I would say we've we created. We certainly didn't. We certainly ad, uh, adapted uh, to what COVID has brought us, and we've been utilizing telemedicine both on the inpatient and outpatient side. But one of the innovations that I credit the house staff uh, to uh, really uh, for is when um, on the inpatient side to reduce the number of exposures but also the cost in gowning up and uh, so donning and doffing was purchasing iPads for the patients on our COVID units so that after you had a bedside visit if no additional bedside visits were urgently indicated you could still communicate with your patients by the use of an iPad but also it allowed the patients to iPad outside of the hospital so they could also connect with their family who couldn't come and visit. So that's uh, one of the innovations we've uh, uh, brought to our bedside with telemedicine. Simulation, we simulate with procedures and codes, and I, I think many programs uh, do that. Uh, but we've also created a very robust curriculum to help improve your communication and cultural awareness skills. That's through our Learning to Talk program and our education through theater arts. And um, they're very innovative. Uh, they are um, partnerships with our Simulation Center, but also Syracuse University's Department of Theater. So it's really a, it's a wonderful program and really has uh, demonstrated tremendous improvement in, in our skills as uh, uh, communicators, which really is the cornerstone of what it means to be a, a good doctor. Rotation X is our quality rotation, and uh, that's where you're gonna have opportunities to learn more about coding and documentation, utilization management, so you learn more about observation versus inpatient. Uh, you'll also uh, have formal opportunities to be evaluated as an educator because we'll put you into formal situations to educate. So uh, think of that as really quality as it relates to clinical care, but also quality as an educator. That's Rotation X. College Bowl is like the game show. So the, the medical jeopardy kind of game show. We break into teams, we round robin, and the ultimate winner gets the College Bowl. It's this 40-year-old silver bowl filled with candies that goes to the winner. We, we change out the candies. They're, those aren't 40 years old. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. And then we have a bioethics department. So each class has a retreat or a forum with the bioethics department, but we don't have the bioethics department create the curriculum. We have each class create the curriculum so that it really is apropos to what their ethical dilemmas are uh, during that particular year. Uh, obviously, uh, speaking to one of our uh, missions, remember, uh, that creating that environment, that culture, is really what's going to allow you to be successful and be that outstanding clinician and scholar. So we recognize that you have a life outside of residency. Uh, just because the ACGME says you can work 80 hours and you can work six days a week, that doesn't mean that we must do that. And so we do everything we can to ensure that there's some balance between your personal and professional lives. And so we have our social and wellness committee to help support that. We have lots of things that are going on throughout the year put on by the social and wellness committee. We have what uh, things we do th during the intern orientation week. We have our recognition dinner. And sir, sure, you know, in-person things had to drop off for a bit because of COVID, but that didn't mean we stopped doing. We just transitioned to where we could virtually. And then where it was, for example, the recognition dinner, we did an in-person, but we did it, for example, at a drive-in where we could stay in our cars, but still have an event. And we showed the recognition dinner as a movie. Um, we have the opportunity to give back to the community, which is a great way to help build wellness and resilience. And that's through, for example, our rural women in residency life. You have the opportunity to do your own check-in for wellness, and that's through the uh, well-being index that we utilize through the Mayo Clinic. We've built in 
time for your wellness in our curriculum, both in the inpatient and outpatient arena. And then if you are in need of support, and obviously you have us in the program, but if you're looking for more formal um, emotional or mental health support, uh, we have uh, contracted with uh, a group that uh, provides 24-7 um, support for our house staff. And then what about when you're done with training? So um, I can think of really three things that you can do as you complete your residency and are ready for independent practice. The first, people will argue I'm biased. I was a chief resident, but I can tell you that outside of perhaps there being bias, I think there's also some objective data that supports the value of a chief residency. If you have a desire to be in academics, uh, chief residency is the foundation upon which a career in academics is built. Not only is it an additional clinical experience, but now you're also becoming a prime educator for the medical school as well as the residency. You're becoming an administrator. So you're learning now about the administrative and business aspects. These are all the cornerstones of a career in academics. If you have a desire to move on, for example, to a fellowship, well, if you look at leaders in, um, in medicine, 80 to 90% of them are chief residents. So what do you think the likelihood is that a fellowship director or a division chief that were reviewing your application was a chief resident? And if they're biased, like perhaps I'm biased, perhaps they're gonna have a bias towards those that did achieve here. And then think about what a chief year adds to your resume though. It adds an additional year to now add more scholarship, right? Uh, to make your resume even stronger when you apply for that fellowship or that hospitalist or that primary care position. If chief year is not an interest and you wanna enter into example hospitalist or primary care medicine, absolutely, uh, you'll be prepared to do that uh, leaving our program. If you desire going into fellowship and you wanna stay at Upstate, these are the fellowships that we offer here at Upstate. So with that, I'm gonna end and encourage you to please come and uh, view the website uh, in greater detail. You can learn much more about the program. Uh, there are videos that you can view. There's also an opportunity to tour the program uh, through a, uh, a tour that's been put together by a company virtually anywhere. So please take advantage and uh, Thanks for visiting. Hopefully we'll see your application and get to meet you either virtually or in person in the future. All the best.